Hello, everyone. This is Joseph Osco with American News Post. Uh, we're doing our uh, bi-weekly sports podcast today, July the twenty-second, twenty thirteen. I'm here with our with our hosts, Michael Magnifici. Good afternoon, everybody. And Frank Oconati. Hi. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. Let's get started, fellas. I think we uh, discussed we we're going to go. Uh, sports is going to be somewhat shortened today because there's just not much going on. We have some golf and baseball. We're going to start with the golf. Go ahead, guys. Well, Mickelson, I mean, he played a hell of a round. He he said before they interviewed him, they said, what do you think it's going to take? He was uh, two over par. He was two over par, and he said that it's around in the 60s, even par, even one over would get him into the mix. What was this called again, this tournament called? The British Open. The British Open. Right. And then Scotland. They played at Murfield in Scotland. And he... He just he birdied four out of the last six holes. He right. just he wound up shooting three under. Uh, Lee Westwood was three under. Mickelson was one over when they started. Here he comes all the way back to where he's three under, and Westwood might be on fire. Was, right? He was on fire. He just made every single putt in the world. He uh, he played. He wanted this tournament, and that, that I was so glad to see him. I, I'm a huge fan of Mickelson. Right. I was a. I always liked him. I, I think that he was a. You know, he was an Arizona State guy, and he was he, he's just a great player. You know, his family he's was all he's there. He's not an Englishman. He's an American. He's American. He's yeah. a man again. Yeah. yeah. And he, uh, he he just played just unbelievable. Um, I'd like to see him get the U.S. Open. That'll complete his slam as far as all. He's won the Masters. He's won the PGA. Now he's won the British. He just hasn't won the U.S. Open. And if you remember, he was in that tournament where he was he had a two shot lead going into the last hole, he and he. Because of his wild play, you know, he's he's a chance taker. Yeah. He takes chances out there. He hit the driver off the tee. He made double bogey to, you know, to lose it. Lose. Yeah. I mean, he, he could have limped it in with wedges all, all the way off the tee. How about Tiger? How did he play? Tiger, you know, there's a lot of talk, and I, and I agree with it, that there's a lot of talk about Tiger not being the Tiger of before. He's won four tournaments this year, which is... You know, unbelievable. You know, yeah, right. guys that give their career that they have to be able to say they won four tournaments. He just is not. You know, with the major, he's measured by the majors. He's measured against Jack Nicklaus, and it's you know to him, it's is he going to catch him? He's got fourteen. He needs nineteen to surpass him, eighteen to tie him. He's just he just not. He doesn't play Saturday and Sunday golf well anymore. Now I don't know if that's because of the scandal with you know him with the with the, the girls girl, and stuff. Right, losing his I don't know if that's you know his mind, his physically you know he's got a couple injuries, got the elbow, got the knee problem, you know, but he still physically is a great. I mean the guy's in shape like you can't believe. He's uh, he's playing well. He's hitting the ball well. I just think that come with these majors on the Saturdays and Sundays. He just doesn't have it mentally. No, mine, mentally, he's lost it, mine, and I don't know what that's about with him. I think that once he gets one, if he could just get one major, get to that 15 level, I think that that'll catapult him. Yeah. That he'll be he'll be something to be reckoned with, you know. But you know, today, Frank, with all the with golf today, there is just back, back when I was playing, you know, when I was growing up in the 70s, and I was following the Nicholas's, the Wise the right. Watsons, you know, players. All these, Gary Player, Billy Casper, all these guys. You had like eight, nine guys. That's all you had to worry about. Right. Now it's like somebody that I can't even tell you who won, the, the, you know, the last right. major. You I know what I mean? It's like all over the board. It's all over young, Europe. Young, you know, you, you got kids guys, playing that yeah. are, you know, Roy McIlroy. I only know him because he's won two. Yeah. You know, uh, but I mean, it's just the, the level of talent has gotten so. Big, big that you know guys like Woods you know they can't face off these guys right. you know and somebody any given day, somebody any given day could do it right. you know it, it's somebody right. um, but it was a great tournament uh, I know you I called you yesterday we both yeah. we shared a little uh, talk about but I, I thought real interesting was that uh, at Fenway Park which the, one of the biggest rivals is Boston and the Yankees right and they gave uh, Mariano Rivera uh, standing ovation. And they Boston hate, fans. And, and, and they, they hate the Yankees. Yankees. They, they hate, hate the Yankees. Well, that's just a tribute to uh, like right. a great this ball This is his player. farewell you know, tour. You know, he's he's going to every uh, stadium he goes to and he thanks, like, you know, the guys that just are, you know, washing dishes, you know. The you grounds know, guy. The grounds guy, you know, guys that are mopping up and stuff. They're, you know, he's doing all of that and I think that's appreciated by, you know. It's, it's, a great, he's an ambassador... Uh, 
He's an ambassador and a half yeah, for baseball. Yeah, he's a class act. And Very much so. People know it. And his, his, his other ball players know what a great guy he right. is. Right. They, they adore him, you know. And, and the other thing with the Yankees, too, is now I guess they're sending A-Rod back you know, to go for more treatment. Cashman, who is the GM for the Yankees, does I don't think he wants anything to do with A-Rod. They want to get out of that contract. They're looking to... You know, Why, what do you think is because of the steroid? Uh, well, sure. I mean, it's too embarrassing. This here, is, the Yankees are, you know, they're the machine right. in baseball. Right. You know, and uh, they're the elite. The, the, team. You know, the Steinbrenners have always, you know, from the boss. You know, they call them the boss. Right. You know, and they've always had the esteem as like they're the nuts of you know National right. League baseball right. or you know baseball in general. Everybody hates the Yankees because they're so good. It's because they're so good. Because yeah. they would pay more. They would you know they would take the hit on the luxury tax. They right. didn't care. Steinbrenner didn't care. Go right. ahead, beat me up on it. I'd rather have the. Two, I want to look at the championships. Right. You know the trophy. Well, you went and got uh, Jeter and A Rod at a time where they were probably the hottest oh, ball players. Out. Well, he got he got A Rod at that time. Jeter he had from you know out oh, of the right, draft sorry. system. Yeah, right. right. He, I mean, he signed them. He, he signed them. Yeah, he right. kept signing them, and uh, you know Jeter is an ambassador of right. the Yankees. He's the he's the only one I've ever known that they call the captain. Right. They didn't even call Lou Gehrig or Babe Ruth the right. captain. He's right. the captain. But how, how they turned sour on him right away, huh? No, not not actually. You know, he, he's he's at the end of his career, and it's going to be Jeter. Up to, Jeter, yeah, it's going to be up to him to decide whether he, you know, does he want to bleed it out? Yeah. You know, I, I think he's not playing. He's he's well, injured. You know, yeah. he, he broke his ankle last year, and. Um, if you see him, he, he could run straight lines okay, but, you know, to play shortstop, to go laterally, yeah, you got to move. You, you move, and I don't see him, you know, it doesn't look like he could do that. They you know, I mean, they could put him on the DH guys. thing because yeah, he has a... farm system's great. They're always bringing up something. Right. I just, you know, I'm a big fan of Jeter. You know, A-Rod, you know, he's, you know, Jeter did it clean. A-Rod, you know... Juiced up, they're it, saying. Yeah, if they're saying, if, if all being said is true, um, he... he, he he fooled all of us, right, you know. Right. His figures. Well, I think it's going to be a big deal. I mean, when oh, names, sure. I mean, they're releasing their names now. I mean, right. It's just, it's and you won't say these guys get into the Hall of Fame. Um, no. The, you know, Matter of fact, they voted nobody in last time. Right. Because uh, no, the, it's it like a, a protest of right. what's going on. Well, you, you'll see that, like, as years go on and the sports writers change, you know, as they get more youthful, right. they're going to be more forgiving. Tolerance, right. Tolerance. Because it was their generation. That was their generation. Right. And they're going to say, you know what, uh, hey, I don't care if McGuire was on the juice, juice and, and, and right. Kitsako. You know, these guys here How about Sammy Sosa? Sosa. Sosa and they, What's Sammy Sosa doing these days? This? No clue. Last time I saw, he couldn't speak English at a... Last time I remember seeing him on television, I think he was... Uh, Bill Clinton's uh, guest at uh, one of the State of the Union addresses. Yeah, oh, I, uh, that's got to be a uh, couple years ago. That was in the yeah, they've been, yeah. they've, The last thing I saw was he was trying to turn his skin white. He was actually bleaching his skin. Was he? Was really? he? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, you're not thinking of Michael Jackson, are you? No, but Sammy no. Sosa. No. Yeah. Well, well, fellas, have we covered uh, the yeah, little bit that much, there is you know, to cover? Yeah, there's, there's really not a whole lot. Uh, football's coming. coming. Football's coming. Can't wait for that. Jaworski, you know, gave out his you know, yeah, he top had three. Good, uh, yeah, he had his top 20, yeah. you know, quarterbacks, top 25 quarterbacks, and uh, he had Aaron Rodgers, number one. Yeah. He had uh, Bradley. Manning. I'm sorry. Then Brady. Brady. Right. And then uh, Drew Brees. Drew Brees. And he actually yeah. had uh, wow. Super Bowl winner. Flacco, you know, Flacco is the, the fifth, which was it like is. shocking to all the analysts. You know, sure. yeah. I mean, he he doesn't. It was shocking to me. Yeah, I, I didn't think he should be. I, I mean, mean, he's, he's Italian. A, and we, you know, yeah, well, that, Italian, yeah, I but, guess uh, you know because of that, I you know I like him being five. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but you know, he was. Now, he, he's, he's a great quarterback, football, but he's not, he's a top fifteen, maybe you know, fifteen, fourteen. He he's in there, you know. You yeah. don't necessarily have to be the best quarterback to win a Super Bowl. Doug Williams won it in the eighty, what was it, eighty right. seven, eighty six, with, Washington. With, with Washington. Washington, and he, you know, he won it. He wasn't the greatest quarterback, right. a great athlete, but just not the greatest quarterback. Right. You know, 
Yeah. But anyway, that, was, that, that was an interesting uh, thing on ESPN. I think it was on. Or yeah, yeah. But yeah. Torsky does that. He's he the, the he's their football. Yeah, he does. But he's their football. He analyst. went to each one twenty-five quarterbacks. Right, like twenty-five. Countdown. We counted them all down. Yeah. He said, and he talked about you know. Canterbury. He, he had Griffin Wilson, in there. Griffin. Uh, you know, RG three was uh, I think ten or eleven. Um, he had uh, not uh, Flacco. We know was five. He had uh, what's the kid from. Uh, the Colts. I know what you're talking about. Uh, Luck. Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck. He had him. Uh, I think eight. Where was nine. our great uh, steamed um, Bears quarterback? You know what? I don't even know if he was in there. He, I don't know if he, he, he had a beat. Yeah. He, well, I don't know about that. I mean, he's he's a gunslinger. He's like a breath fire of this. Well, if you don't have a year this year, it's not. He's, I think he's. Well, he, he needs a line to block for him. You know, you can't sit back there and get pounded. This guy here is taking 10 hits a game, and he's a tough guy. You know, you saw what he went through that whole year. You've got to have a line blocking for him. And if he has that, he could throw the ball all over the place. I mean, and I don't mean all over wildly. He could put it in. He's got a tight end now, and he's got that Brandon, right? Brandon Marshall. Brandon Marshall. That's his guy that he was with, uh, with him in Denver, and, you know, that, that's a big thing for him. They're like their go-to hookup. Right. Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But anyway, uh, like I say, there's really not a whole lot to talk about right. in sports. Cubs and Sox are... Cubs and Sox, you know... Cubs are doing better, but... Uh, Cubs are doing better than the Sox. Yeah. You know, the record is better. Um, and I think that this, you know, I'd like to see if the Cubs, I think that their goal is, and I, I don't, obviously they're not going to be in the playoffs, but if they could get close to 500, I think that's a huge stepping stone for them, you know, for, for what... Year. For what uh, which the well, Epstein, what, is the what Epstein has done. Yeah. You know, he's with one year, you know, was like, you know, just garbage year. Right. And then he drafted, you know, and I think that the Cubs, if they could get like a 500 year this year, I think that's like almost to them making the playoffs because right. they're still building. You know, they still right. have the youth, and, the you know. Core group of guys. Right, right. All right. Um, those of you in our audience uh, are sports piece is complete. I want to thank Michael and, and Frank for the good information. The, uh, the golf stuff is always exciting uh, during these times. And um, just for those of you that uh, are solely tuned in to our sports piece, you may go about the rest of your day and have a good one. For the others who like to stick around and listen to our behind the scenes, uh, I invite you to do so at this point. I'd also like to mention uh, to our sports listeners out there that we will be back with A&P Sports Podcast on uh, this Thursday, uh, which is pretty much our routine, Thursday, July the 25th, 2013. And uh, now I think we could go into our behind-the-scenes segment. Uh, guys, I just want to point out that uh wanted to kind of apprise you of some comments that are coming in on the American News Post comment threads uh, under your, Michael, your sports column. Uh, and they're for both of you, obviously. Both of you do the sports show. Um, the Some of the commenters are suggesting that American News Post considers doing another podcast for political corruption where you, Michael, would have the option of being a part of it or not because everyone knows that you're, you're reluctant to go into certain areas. You're more willing to go into things that, that, don't, that won't cause immediate conflict with people who are alive today. You, you're, That's correct. You're being very careful about that. Where Frank, on the other hand, who's um, uh, politically involved, he's an activist, he... Unlike you, he likes to to target that kind of stuff, and so there's been the suggestion that we consider doing two different shows completely, maybe uh, you know, like I said, strictly on political corruption and things. And of course, you would have the opportunity to come into it if you wanted to or not. Right. Uh, also, both of you receive a lot of uh, compliments. Uh, people are interested in both of you uh, for your distinct um, for the distinct the subject matter that both of you bring to the table um, some people are a little discouraged with Frank for seeming uh, o 
overly aggressive in wanting to interrogate you, and they fear that his style could possibly cause you to resign from the program, and, and they like to hear what you have to say, so they're, they're worried a little bit about that. But And that was, I think that was, Indicated before we had our under, before we formed our understanding last week and right. set up some guidelines and things. Um, that's that's basically it. What I wanted to talk to you about. Oh, before we start with what I want to talk to you about, someone's uh, insisting on knowing who Chucky the Head is, and I know he's a friend of yours, and you probably don't want to give out his last name. No, I would prefer not to. Is there anything you could explain about him in a in a delicate way to just give somebody who's desperate to know, I won't say desperate, eager to know who Chucky the Head is or what he is? Well, Chucky was, uh, he was a big-time bookmaker. I see. And he... Uh, who's a big time gambler, mm -hmm. and <laughs> he he bet and he booked. He had the best of both worlds yeah. going, and he he was he was one of the sharpest guys I ever knew. I mean, right. we coattail his players. I mean, yeah. I would with several friends of mine who remain unnamed. Mm -hmm. um, we coattail his plays. Yeah. You know, he'd give you the you know give you the we say hey, big guy. You know, he whoever this guy is, he knows that Chucky would always refer to somebody as a hey, big guy, a hey, big guy. That's how he talked to everybody, and. Uh, he was he was one of the best. Gotcha. You know, he would he would have a, you know he'd have a strong opinion. Now, was when he, did, what, he was a bookmaker. Was he a boss? Did he have an office? No, just a bookmaker. So he was under someone. Right. How many players was he responsible for bringing in? You know, in your Chuck recollection, Ar Chucky's Armenian, and uh, that's a very tight knit group of people. Oh, I see. And he had a lot of restaurant owners that were there. He didn't have a whole lot. He didn't have like 200 players in his office. Okay. Chucky probably had, you know, 10, 8 guys, but they bet enormous amounts of money. Sure. They would bet 1000 1500 a game. And Chucky, I, I think Chucky would basically, how he was so sharp at betting, he mm -hmm. would just bet against what they played. You know, if they yeah. played the Cubs and they were playing St. Louis and the guy gave him a play on the Cubs, he would call in the, the office and bet St. Louis. <laughs> and you, you, your idea, and I just want to verify your recollection of these things. You're talking about stuff that's in excess of ten years from today's date. In excess. Oh, it's back in the eighties. Yeah. Okay. So it's even more than that. Okay. I wouldn't be but talking it's, about it's, it. It's in right. excess of ten years. Right. But if it was in 1805, it's in excess exactly. of ten years. Okay. Well, here's what I want to get to. Uh, in preparation of this show, we uh, touched base this morning and over the weekend and uh, as uh, and I want to thank you for by the way for agreeing to to cover some outfit stuff uh, but of course stuff that you pick and choose and know that you're not going to have Johnny DeFranco sending a hit squad into your house well, and murdering you in your bed in the morning uh, and, and I don't believe that what we've lined up is going to cause that and I'm sorry if I made you uncomfortable by bringing well, that in I, 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 I apologize <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know the image of that might be somewhat uh, upset, upsetting um, there, this, you're going to tell us you're prepared to tell us about a meeting and what the reason for the meeting pertained to in this meeting I'll just state the, the, the approximate date and location and then you could uh, take it from there, but it's a meeting that uh, occurred at the Hilton O'Hare Gaslight Club uh, right around the New Year's Day um, 1986. It was either just, a, you said, a little before the holiday, a little after. 85, and then 86. Yeah, yeah. Well, I said New Year's Day '86. Oh, right, right. Would, would, it was after would, that, right? It would, was '86 then, right? But you were telling me that the meeting took place either right before the New Year's Day holiday, which could have been in '85, December of '85, right. or shortly after. It was in the winter time. I'm not. I'm unclear of what yeah. you know. If it was, just but it was, after, it was. It was. It was right in that. It area. was right around within the, the first within weeks of the. Uh, Are you sure weeks? Couple of like seven days. Okay, days. so within a, we'll say within a week of about the the first, first of the year, first correct. of the year, going from 1985 into 1986. Correct. Okay, what would you like to tell us about this meeting at that time in that time frame? Well, once again, at the, the Hilton O'Hare. 
Gaslight the Gaslight Club. Club uh, I drove Jack there, and we had a uh, he had a meeting. You know, if, if I may, I know you. How old were you when you started driving Jacks around the the other boss of the Chicago outfit under Joseph Ayupa? How old was I? Yeah, when you first took him for his first ride somewhere. We, well, I was probably a teenager. Okay. But now, what was... That was just golfing, going to the driving range. And now, stuff. I wasn't... You know. And Willie Messino drove him around a lot, too. Right. But when Jack was indicted on the Strawman case, something about that changed. Well, Willie was it because of Willie's uh, record. He was a convicted felon. He was a convicted felon. He wasn't allowed... So that, would be, that would be a violation of Jack's bond. Okay. So, so when Jack was under indictment, you became pro, pro, primarily the primary driver, more so right. even than Willie at right. that time frame. Right. And Willie wound up getting uh, special permission that he could, because they lived right down the block from each other. Mm -hmm. You know, they both lived on 77th, mm -hmm. you know, in Armitage. Yeah. You know, and Willie wound up getting special permission to be able to be in his company. Lifelong friends, this and that. At what point, when he was on bond? Yeah, when he was on bond. Okay. But, but Willie was, you know, I was... You know, then why, why did you become the primary driver well, if Willie was, was Jack, allowed to be around? we'd be golfing a lot, and it was just basically okay. that. Okay, I see, so those were the reasons. You know, those were the reasons, you know. Is it is it that when uh, Jack immediately went on bond, he was a little unclear if Willie could be around him, and then they eventually arranged where he exactly. could, but right. at that point you had already been commissioned to be his primary driver. Right. And Willie didn't mind that at all, because you know what, it was... Uh, I'm sure he didn't it mind older, it at all. Yeah, it was taxing. Who wants to drive uh, the same guy around for a hundred years. Right, you know? he, he didn't mind it at all, yeah. and uh, you know, to, to pass that along to me. Was it was a, he was happy. <laughs> yeah, he he didn't spend some time. Willie, turn left, <laughs> son of a <laughs> bitch. Right, you know, yeah, that only <laughs> knows what uh, went on in that car. <laughs> Um, but we, you know, on one of those particular days, we had to go uh, have a meeting, or he did, Jack did. And like I say, I never knew. He'd send me in the dunce chair, basically. To okay, now you're going back to the meeting that, you're, the like that you want to talk about, the, the, that happened right around the first of uh, the year of 1986, a little before, a little after, at the Hilton O'Hare Gaslight Club. Correct. You drove Jack to the meeting. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, drove there, and, and Sam, I, I thought, uh, well, I didn't think anything, but when I saw Sam come in, Carlisi, uh, who was obviously the boss after underneath Joey O, mm -hmm. um, he came there to that meet for whatever reason. And Joey, Joey, Joey O'Brien, Joey Ayupa didn't make that meet, okay. and he sent Sam there. Yes. To do, and I don't know who Sam was with. And mm -hmm. He walked in alone and mm -hmm. he left alone. I didn't see who if he had a driver or, or, or whatever. Well, Jack tells me to go sit, you know, sit we'll go a couple of tables down. Sit a couple of tables yeah. down. He was talking a little loud, and I kind of got... And this is inside of the Gaslight Club at this point. Correct. Were and there was the, nobody around. Were you in the bar area or yes. the, the booth area when you walked well, you know, in? Right, or the yeah, dining right, room? right in the, yeah, right in the bar Where the area. stage is in the bar exactly. and all that. And there okay. was nobody there. It was 12 o'clock in the afternoon. The sure, it's usually... And he just told, what did he say? Like, so we're going to the Gaslight Club? He didn't well, he just said, we'll go to the airport, we got to go meet uh, a friend of mine. And he introduced me to the guy, saying that this is Mr. Benny, who I later found that out. you're inside the gas lake. Like, right. He this came is in. Before you sat down. Before yes. I sat down. He sat down, you know, and then Jack told me to go, you know, mm -hmm. go sit over there. I got to yeah. talk to these fellows. And it was uh, the, the chin, Benny the Chin Giganti. Benny the Chin Giganti. And Tony, Sol and Tony Salerno. And, um, Tony Salerno. And what I heard from them um, like I said, within earshot of them was it was right after. Oh, the if I may, if I may interject, a week or two before the meeting, there was a a, a big murder that took place in New York, and who was that that was killed? Castellano. Paul Castellano. Right. Was this meeting? Uh, now Jack was Jack on the commission that governed all the families and outfits in the United States of America. He was representative of Chicago. Jack was. Yeah. Well, you have any idea when he went on the commission? Was it in the 70s, I, maybe? I have no clue. I would imagine the minute he became yeah. you know, underboss, I would imagine that that so went me, along yeah, with it. Let me get some straight for the listeners if they don't understand. The commission was still going on in the 80s. Where right. all the imam leaders from all over yep. would still meet and try to get along yes. on certain issues. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Okay, now, so this is a commission-related meeting. It's obviously not the entire commission, but it's commission people that are on the commission right. that were at this meeting. 
and it was in the wake of the Castellano hit. And okay, just want to catch everyone up. Go ahead, Michael. Well, what he had said. And who's he? When you Jack. Said, okay. Had said, you know, like I say, I'm within earshot of these. Yeah. Chicago is not going to put up with this bullshit. And what I got from it, like I say, the, you know, they quieted it down a little bit. But what I got from what they were talking about was that Jack was not going for the fact that you just start killing bosses for no reason. Was the guy a snitch? No, he wasn't. Who was he directing this anger at? Was he mad at Gingotti and uh, Salerno? No, he was telling them to straighten out their shit well, out in, in not, New York. Okay, because but, these guys were the, you know... But now Giganti, Giganti and, and, and Salerno they were... They were the Genovese family. They were the Genovese family, right. and Castellano was what in the, Gen in the Gambino family. Was there any was there any comment from from Chicago in this meeting about uh, about uh, John Gotti? Well, that's who they were targeting about it. I now, did I actually hear that? I, I no, I did not. But I knew. I mean, obviously, we all know that it was you know Gotti that. Jeff well, how, how do we all know that? Well, because he's, you know, uh, Garano has testified that he worked on the hit. Okay, but uh, uh, go, he, going, he but, but, but that was after the f fact. I'm going back to the Gaslight Club when we didn't know who testified about what, and at that point in time, how would you have been able to know that they were referring to John Gotti, unless you heard the name? It, it was just kind of common knowledge, you know. I common mean, I, among who? Amongst us. Me? No, not you. Me <laughs> and people that are. Were there were there uh, earlier conversations during the day or the days ahead, uh, the days before the meeting that you heard Jack talking to people? I never heard Jack saying anything, but I heard other people who were so just as people just around as Jack. Jack. Right. And so you knew what was brewing based on exactly. what the peanut gallery was saying. Right. And so, they were right. So by the time you were at this meeting, you're shot of these. Conversations, these, these. It all made sense. Then. You, you, you knew what the, the what the score right. was. Yeah. I see. Okay. So I mean, it's, it's, it, it does. It sounds a little, uh, you know, unclear, mm -hmm. but it isn't. It yeah. Mean, well, it, it, we clarified it all. It's right. not unclear at all at this point. Um, but you know, that was that was something. You know, you live by the rules. Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, Jack, JB, you know, these guys are all, you know, rest in peace. They're all guys that they live by the rules. And JB is a uh, Tony Acarda. And if you don't live by the rules, you've got you know a lot of chaos going mm -hmm. on. You know, and that's that's something that these guys you know wanted so much against. Right. You so know, in Chicago. Uh, right. And and based on what happened with Castellano, a boss of the Gambino family, being killed by who everyone seems to believe was John Gotti, even though I don't believe. Was, was he ever indicted for that? I, I'm not clear yes. on all of oh, yeah, Okay, I don't know anything about John yeah. Gotti. Gravano testified. Okay. testified. I don't know anything about Gotti. Don't they, care about him either. Gravano and, and, uh -huh. and Gotti plotted that. Okay, so that's what you were referring to earlier when you were right. talking about the testimony that came out. Okay. But that's just all public uh -huh. knowledge. Yeah, yes. right. I'm not saying anything yes, yes, that's yes. secret. I, Chicago is my uh, area of interest, obviously, okay. clearly. I don't know anything about any, we don't know much about anything outside of Chicago. Uh, but it was, it's a good education, this conversation, and thank you for it, both of you. Um, when when you heard this, this meeting, was it in your opinion that that Sarone was speaking on a commission level about Chicago's position that they were I not? I believe so. They were not... Not uh, satisfied with what you know. They, 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 they were upset about. They it. were upset about it. You know that is something that you know uh, about the Castellano hit. Yeah. Right, but you know that guy didn't. And I've heard from. And Gambino was upset about. I'm sorry, correct me. Uh, and that Gambino, Salerno was upset about it. Right. And uh, and uh, Giganti was upset about it. Exactly. Everyone was upset about All it. All the bosses the in New York. Was people. Sam Carlisi upset about it? Uh, yeah, he, I, he I believe he was. I mean, I didn't. I can't sit here and tell you what I heard. He him didn't. Say. He, he didn't articulate it in full detail. No, but, but he, can, he wasn't there he, for no reason. So I mean, yeah. it was. You know, he's with his guy, mm -hmm. with Jack. You know. Now let me ask you this, Michael. Changing the subject a little, just a little bit. I mean, 
we we contend we have contended in the past that Jack Cerrone was a, a a major conspirator in the assassination of uh, Sam Mooney Giancana. Why would Jack Cerrone feel that he could take part in a conspiracy to murder a boss uh, like Sam Giancana, but uh, John Gotti can't uh, do the same exact thing? What, well, what, what, was there anything different about these well, two? Sure was what? Was different, you know, and I don't want to, you know, friends of mine are relatives of uh, Mooney, mm-hmm. Sam Giancana, um, but he was, you know, off the charts nuts. Mm-hmm. You know. Okay, but what if what if John Gotti felt that Paul Castellano was off his chart now? Who was but the psychiatrist no. brought into this to give a mental no. a, a mental health no. evaluation? How, how, do, how does a gangster decide, you know, whose psyche whose psychiatric condition is worse than the other? Gotti decided yeah. to do that just for the typical greed, you know, wanted mm-hmm. the, that spot. And, and why would we think that uh, G, uh, that Cerrone didn't uh, want uh, his piece was, of it was, it, was, it was for the better of the organization. Would that, would the uh, one possible difference I could think of is as a possibility? Did sir, do you think that when Chicago made the decision to knock uh, Sam Giancana down, that they went and got commission approval for it? I would assume so. Okay, so you assume that that there was commission approval to kill Giancana. I don't think so. And it's clear there was no commission approval to kill Castellano. Right. So that's a big difference. There is a big difference. I mean, you won't... That meeting wouldn't have taken place if it was a commission okay thing. Yeah, sure, there'd be no need for it. No need for it because they've already voted. The Gas Club meeting, yes. They've already voted on it, and they said, that okay, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. And, well, very interesting stuff. Um, the um, with Gotti, with Gotti, he was an aggressive young Turk leader, right? Mm-hmm. And um, Castellano was a son-in-law of the previous boss, if I'm not mistaken. Brother-in-law. Yeah, brother-in-law. Brother-in-law of Gambino. So Gotti just said, you know what? We got to change things up without any approval well, he, from the old timers, which Saron was considered, right? Yes, he was. Uh, he was under Neil Delacroix, who was the underboss, right? Underneath the. Uh, Carl Gambino. Right. And when Carl was ailing and sick and eventually died, I think it was 74, 75, something like that, and he turned it over to his brother in law, everybody thought that Neil Delacroix should have got that spot. Right. And there were some, you know, rumblings. And uh, Gotti was very loyal to Neil Delacroix. He was like a street guy. Right. Uh, Castellano was kind of like, you know, put the suit and tie on. Yeah. Tie, you know, he Go was through like the motion leader. Right. He was like right. a business. Guy, but isn't, guy isn't, guy. So what was Gotti from New York saying to Chicago? You know, fuck you, right? Actually, well, it basically because is. he figures the Chicago mob is nothing but a minor league anyway, right? Well, yeah, they've always felt that way. New York they always, always felt that. Yeah, they've always felt them. that. So when Giganti, Giganti is his name, Chin Giganti, Giganti and uh, what's the other guy, Salerno? Tony Salerno. Oh, I've got to ask a question. Did Giganti, when he showed up at the gas light club, did he have a robe on? No. Oh, okay. I just wanted <laughs> that was all the bullshit. You know, <laughs> yeah, but were these, He was as seen as, yeah. you know. There was a generation of, uh, like, Saron. They had a lot oh, of... Oh, sure. He was around, you know. He they, was around, they tried he was to stay Lucky, within the rules. You know, Luciano, who started, you know, everything. He's right. the one that put the commission right. together. Lucky right. did. And he, you know, he's the one that, you know, formulated it. He did but, it all. But, uh... Gotti in New York are way ahead of Chicago anyway, right? I wouldn't go there. Well, I don't know why you say I, that. Because they, they still got a lot of control over the unions and everything else in New York. Chicago looks like little by little it's just the yeah, I, you know, I, I heard there was a disgruntled employee recently at DNP Trucking that uh, called the union and uh, was reinstated immediately uh, against uh, the uh, over the objection of the DeFranzo family. So, that's interesting that you point out that yeah. you think that the New York yeah, outfit, happened in New York. New York families are stronger with the union. Well, they still got the the the, the So what? Are, so what are you telling the, Michael about uh, things? With, what he's telling me is nothing that I would even want to get into. The, the fact of the matter is, is that New York, and with all due respect to them, there's a lot of great guys that are from New York, but they run they run towns. You know the Bronx. You know Manhattan. Five families. They, they, like they got five families. They got a boss. And the right. girls, they got yeah. a boss and an underboss for everything. They got eighty-eight the couples. The, the two billion. They have multiple outfits. Right. They have all of that. But they try to work together as one. 
Well, did you see they're killing each other every day of the week? Well, so in Chicago, I mean, how are they working? The Chicago, together? they're putting everybody in jail. They're, well, they started it. New York, the, the, the stool pigeon. When you look in the dictionary underneath the word stool pigeon, it says AKA New York. How which which dictionary is this? Is the outfit dictionary? How can you say that? Because, because it is. They, they, they're the first to steal, first to squeal. They're, yeah. You know, they, they even invented it. Well, you know, Capone came from New York. Okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And where did but, it wind up? In Chicago. But be, they ended up in Chicago. But because, because uh, New York is. Uh, because the Family Secrets case was probably one of the more recent major cases which in organized, w- was, yeah. which which was an organized crime matter, I could see where Chicago, you know, it, it's it's like um, weak. No, it, 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 Chicago was the very last outfit that really embarrassed themselves. The most recent. Well, if I'm wrong, you know, the N- Calabrese was you know, he was the yeah. guy that I mean, it was one guy. Yeah. That brought down a lot of people, right? You know, we're in New York. A lot of have, critical people. You have well, I, I would, it would even, I would say it was the Calabrese family. Period. Because right. it, it was a domino effect that just right. kept expanding it just kept, yeah, through it the fall down, fall entire down, family. Right. Yeah. But I mean, you look at New York; they got the eighteen thousand stool pigeons in one crew. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, but it always looks like they seem to have somebody primed for the next guy up, moving up. In, the and minor they leagues, up, in they Chicago, it looks like it looks like um, you, Frank. You know what? You know, one guy you watch your biography channel, and when they have you know who blows this shit. I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to. And you'll I, sit there. You'll sit there and watch and see that these guys here. The guys that you know they in New York. New York. These guys are they're beef. Bosses beef on bosses. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous. Chicago's not like that. Mm-hmm. Chicago's got a whole lot more respect. Um, Amongst them, you know, amongst the, the ranks in this and that. Here in, in New York, you got the five families still, as far as everybody knows. I'm not in New York either. I don't, I don't go know. there. I would never want to live there. But uh, in Chicago, it's got one boss all the time, one major boss, and in, in uh, what do you call them? The guys that are oh under, the capos, the capos. And well, the capos look like. Um, you know, so they don't have any kind of power. So the, the Capos in Chicago all are with the same family, obviously. They're, right. The, it's not a, like a New York. Well, I know we, in family. Chicago we got the Chinatown crew. We had the Grand Avenue crew. We had the Elmwood Park crew, Melrose Park. But they were all controlled would, would, by... Me, would Melrose Park and Elmwood Park be considered the same right now? Right. Or would, would Melrose Park and Cicero be... They're all different. A little uncomfortable talking about yeah, all that. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Just, just so, you know, talking about I, New York guys is one thing. There. Yeah, but New York, to me, is, they're, uh, you know, um, they still can't, they have, listen, the New York outfit still has, as far as, you know, what I see and what you read, they still got the unions. Politicians are still scared of the unions there. Our union here, up on well, the you can't days. say that the we, uh, you know Chicago and New York, the two cities that you have an, a crime culture, very significant crime culture, uh, an organized crime culture. You have people that are being born into it on a daily basis. That from the Capone days all the way until now, people are continually born and raised in, and married in and acquainted and associated into this culture where court reporters, the people that grow up and become court reporters, and they get in because their uncle knew somebody that right. knew somebody, and now they're in there, and they're wrapped up in that culture, and they automatically <laughs> bend over backwards for other people in the culture. Police officers become police officers. They go to work on the department because their uncle was a captain and could get him in, and it's, their it's uncle, their uncle was Why under uh, but teeth, they're there. Teeth they're there. Moody, right. and right. It, it's the culture, and the culture goes on and on and on, and it'll, and therefore this whole thing goes on and on and on. It may become camouflaged at certain points. It may be uh, not as well defined by the general public or understood or discoverable, but it is the culture is there. It's uh, yeah, it is. I think the best cure for the state of Illinois is to dissolve it and expand the the uh, borders of Wisconsin and Indiana to just meet just halfway right over the state of Il- uh, where the state of Illinois used to yeah, be. And every elected official should be 
uh, barred for life uh, forever holding office ever again in Illinois. Completely on county, state, local, and federal in Illinois. They should be out of out of a job for life. Mm-hmm. That would be one way we might be able to uh, to limit the culture or compromise the, the organized crime culture. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll I'll slow down a little bit. And uh, I'm sorry, Frank. Did I was I talking no, over you? No, I, I can't agree with you more. I mean, I just mm-hmm. uh, I think it's so um, deep in this state mm-hmm. that um, I don't see any solution right now. And these uh, guys. And these the outfit keeps flourishing under these politicians, and it just it's, keeps it's going. the culture. Yeah. It's not something in the water. It's the culture. Yeah. Michael, uh, you were talking about New York and beefers, eighteen thousand stool pigeons, and etc. Some people call you a beaver because you're doing a sports podcast and you're allowing for the uh, discussions to go off a little bit into uh, things that uh, a guy like yourself should otherwise have no part in. Uh, others are saying, no, Michael Magnifici is not a beefer. He's not. He didn't put anybody in jail. He hasn't revealed anything that is causing people to um, to uh, disengage in whatever they're doing with uh, whatever it is they do, and that you're just talking about things that may raise an eyebrow or two here and there. But in, at the end of the day, it's not really affecting anyone. So. So your fans are saying, no, no, he's not a beefer. A beefer is a guy like uh, one of the Calabrises that got on the stand, put his hand up in the air, swore, testified, convictions came out, people were hauled off to penitentiaries or, or prisons or whatever. And uh, and uh, and uh, well, I would never talk about anything about that anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, I I signed up to do a sports podcast. If Thank you. Want to if you want to talk about some things that. The, Innocently, you know, innocent stories from 25 years ago. Well, when, when you say innocent, nothing that you ever said about the outfit is truly innocent. What, 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 well, I what mean, do you mean? Innocent, the fact that nobody could get in trouble for it uh-huh. because they're all they're all deceased. And yeah, and I, I gotta I agree. He, and he's not hiding behind some curtain. Right. He's sitting down the open. And one thing I was telling Michael over the weekend, Frank, when we were talking a little bit about, you know, what story he'd be willing to share today, and we know what the story is down. Thank you again, Michael. It was valuable information. It was very powerful. That, um, the commission. What, when we were talking over the telephone, Michael and I, we were trying to gauge how what the perception of uh, other people's perception is, what, what he's doing. And, and I said, you know, Michael... Everybody's got an outfit story. Hell, Johnny DeFranco himself told me at the Loon Cafe once, after I showed him an Uncle Fester head that I was planning to send to uh, the attorney Jack Cerrone's now old and former uh, nightclub that I don't even remember the name of it. It was somewhere uh, near Michigan Avenue. It was some ridiculous uh, Sinatra memorabilia place, uh, Rat Pack or whatever. And I, I remember being at the Loon, and I, I asked Johnny, are you going down to, to the grand opening of uh, Jackie Cerrone's new uh, nightclub? He said, no, of course not. And I said, well, I'm sending a present down there, a, a business warming present, uh, a grand opening present. He said, no, you're not. He couldn't believe that I would do that. I said, uh, I'm going to go get it and show it to you. I brought this box into the Loon. I put it on the bar. I took the top off. And there was a, a head of Uncle Fester. I bought it in a Halloween store. It was right around Halloween time that the grand opening took place. So the Halloween stores, the Kmart, Target, whatever, the Halloween aisles, were loaded with all this sort of memorabilia. And it was actually a candy tray that um, had a little button. And you put the candy in it. There's the Uncle Fester head there. You push the button and take the candy. And it, the, the head said something like Happy Halloween and the eyes and it, it groaned it went mm, <laughs> and the eyes went back and forth and Johnny looked at the Uncle Fess head he spit out his drink he had his vodka in his mouth he spit it out the floor <laughs> thought it was hysterical and he started pushing the button uh, it uh, I don't know what I did with it. Oh, what did I do with it? I sent it to Jackie Cerrone. I don't know what he did with it, but I, I would be certain that the uh, uh, fingerprint of, uh, I don't know if he hit it with a stub finger or his, uh, his real finger, oh. but his fingerprint might still be on that button to corroborate my story. But he pushed the button, 
and it it was the, the moan was fainted it was it was not a clear moan it wasn't as powerful as it was supposed to be the only uh, directive Johnny gave me on that was he said you better change the batteries in that thing because he wanted it to really uh, yell when when they pushed it and then I remember when Johnny took a look at the note it said uh, I put a, I put the put it back in the box I had uh, a friend of ours that owns uh, a courier service. And maybe it wasn't our friend, but I had a courier service come and get it from the loon and bring it down to Jackie. And uh, Johnny said, how do you know he'll open that? I said, oh, he'll open it. Take a look at the uh, the card. And it said to Jackie, my pal Jackie, uh, congratulations on your new joint, your friend Joey A. And Johnny said, but you've got Joey A's name on there. He goes, why would you do that? He's not sending it. You're sending it. I said, well, then I pulled it. I pulled the note out a little longer. I said, well, look at the explanation on it. And he and it said, Joey A, comma, your friend Joey A Fosco, because my middle name's Anthony. And Johnny said, oh, your middle name's uh, your initial, your Joey A Fosco. I said, yeah. He goes, oh, I didn't know that. Now you explained that I see the note. He goes, that's pretty clever. <laughs> so. When we sent that down by Jackie Cerrone, I had some inside people over there mention that he was not too uh, happy about it. I, I, it was just a gag gift, Michael. Now, Michael, you love Jack Cerrone Sr. like a second father. Correct. Isn't that correct? Yes. I mean, does it make you want to put a, a fork in my Adam's apple that I did something like that? You probably would rather I didn't. I would rather you didn't do it, mm -hmm. obviously, because I, you know, the tremendous amount of respect and love I have for the man, I just wouldn't want anybody poking any fun at him yeah. at all, especially Uncle Fester. Wasn't there a story where you guys were downtown one night and uh, Jackie, uh, the old man, got a little boisterous with a pianist, and the pianist made a comment to him and said, "Hey, take it easy, Jackie Coogan." Yeah. And that was the guy, the actor that played that played, played uh, Uncle Fester. Yeah, that, we were at bases, and uh, <laughs> what? What? he had been, you know, <laughs> you know, the big, the tip jar, the fishbowl. Yeah, the big yeah. fishbowl. Jack was, you know, dumping in twenties and tens and this and that. And <laughs> when he said to Jack, hey, "Take it easy, Jackie Coogan. I'll play the song I want to play." He says, "Yeah." And he reached it. He didn't hit him, or yeah, he, he just reached in that big fishbowl, took out uh, everybody's tip that was in there. He said, now you get nothing, <laughs> and put it in his pocket. And that guy, did, he, he didn't realize how lucky he was. Well, he, that was the best thing that happened. <laughs> he you know, because I mean, I was shitting in my pants because you don't know this guy. Say, bust a chair over his prick's head. Bust a chair to break his fingers. Yeah, won't be able to know, play. But again. he just went to yeah. Now you get nothing. <laughs> keep playing it. He played the song that Jack wanted to hear. <laughs> but anyway, we got way off the sports once again. Well, no, we we ended the sports and we were on the um, on the uh, behind the scenes stuff, okay. which is never sports related, as you know. But I, I I get the feel you're at this point probably you would like to uh, end the uh, behind the yes, scenes. Yes, please. Uh, Frank, any last uh, thing you wanna? Just that I hope the uh, listeners um, understand what they just heard today about the commission. Very interesting. Valuable the commission stuff. up until 80s is still mm -hmm. around. And maybe later. We just didn't ask oh, that no, question. Oh, no, no. I think it's still around. I yeah. just, the point is everybody thought the commission was broke up in the 50s oh, right, when see. John Kennedy was around. Yeah. But uh, Mike just verified it's still around in the 80s. Yeah. That there was a it survived uniform... Kennedy. Um, um, ideal, mm -hmm. and that they all tried to work together as one. The outfit. Yeah, it's so it, it's sur it survived. It's and certainly. and the pressure that uh, Gotti caused a lot of these guys wasn't really known until uh, no well anyway. Yeah, right. I mean, no, that the people were upset about the hit. So what we did learn to clarify what you're saying that the commission certainly survived the Kennedy administration. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, for those of you who um, forgot, we will be back Thursday with uh, our sports piece and another behind-the-scenes piece. Thursday, July 25th, 2013. Have a wonderful couple of days until we talk to you again. Uh, we'll have some. We'll have some baseball to talk about by then. You know, it's getting back in the swing after the All-Star game. Football, more football. More football. You know, it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the off-season. 
moves that these teams and, are and making. Especially the Bears. I mean, yeah. Get a new coach. And, and, and for the record, when I went into the whole explanation on the Uncle Fester head, I was building up to a point, and I got so enthralled in the in the in, in describing the story, and so moved by some of Michael's. Uh, facial uh, gestures as he was listening to the story that I was distracted and lost my point on that story. So, But I don't remember what my point was, why I brought it up, but nonetheless it was still an interesting piece that I did provide uh, uh, regarding Uncle Fester. Uh, I guess that's it then, guys. That's it. We'll see you on Thursday.